So around a bottle of tequila, several years ago, when ta you, you didn't hear the story that Town and I, and I met when I was about to marry. He arrived to my life one week before I was to before my wedding party. So that he was my present from from the devil. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, coming him from an institution with a large tradition in biological collections and getting to, a, to an institution that was beginning to do the research on biological collections, it became really clear that we needed to construct the database. We needed to obtain the database, the, the information of the data in the, of the Mexican birds in different collections to develop the, cert, the set of, the, uh, of analysis we wanted to, to say. Now we are in a problem. We, we decided that we have to, we, we want to make this, this recopilation of databases, of, of data of specimens. We needed some money. And this is a problem that all of us confront when having projects as large as, as this. Remember that this was started about 1990 in, a, in an age of no, no digitalization, mass, massive digitalization of database of collections. But it was a, it was a moment in which the Mexican government created this entity that is CONAVI, that is our commission, national commission for the knowledge and use of biodiversity. This is a government guided institution that has a responsibility of obtain of getting funding to different researchers to get the data of different taxa and different collections. The Conavio once put, put together all the information, put the information available for the public of whoever wants to use it, and also develops a series of analysis relevant for the biodiversity of Mexico. We also have programs, and this is a recommendation I have for you, that uh, allow founding agencies, local and foreign, to do research on biodiversity. For example, in Mexico we have CONACYT, that is our funding, our science funding institution, working together with National, National Science Foundation, that is the American institution for doing science, and they have this program in which each part co collaborates with half of the budget. So we were able to obtain that money for the university, and there is, a, uh, there is a program by the British Council, a collaborative program that we use that for doing that. So we, we have here kind of a flux diagram of how the database of the Atlas was constructed. It's from uh, from, from down to up, because we have to start, as in any work, from, from very low. We have several data sources. We have the bibliography, we have collection databases, that means that some of the collections that we surveyed were already being digitized. We had collection catalogs, and part of our, uh, of our work, as Town pointed you out before, was surveying the very old books in which the databases, in which the specimen data was written. And most of our work was surveying directly the, the collection of specimens. This is a geographic pattern of the data sources of the Mexican bird atlas. As you can see, a great amount of the data are outside Mexico, a great amount of the data are scattered around the, collect the main biological collections along the United States and Canada. And Europe. One thing is very important here, we were able to go to all these cities we were able to know all these museums and the bars that are adjacent to the, to the museums. <laughs> but, but, but also, 
we, we noticed something. There is a very different approach of how to care biological collections among the North American, the European, and the Mexican collections. When you go, I, I don't know if you have had the opportunity to go to the British Museum. It is an, an institution that takes good care of the collections. But I don't know if you have had, so any of you have had the chance to go to the Paris Museum. You, you need to find specimens be, uh, below uh, an amount of dust that was left by Buffon like 200 years ago. You, you, when you pay, pull, pull up the specimens, you have one leg and one beak and one head <laughs> and one label somewhere. The, the idea of biological collections in Europe and the idea of curators of biological collections in Europe are so different than in America. In, in Europe, the collections are treated as archives. And the curators are mostly the guys that take the dust out of the specimens. In, in contrast, in other, in other countries, collections are very well, very, very well curated because they are sources of biodiversity that, have, that are very important. Just a few examples that we, we also, once we surveyed all, all this, all these collections, we can find some patterns of where the main interest of the collections were, where, where were the main geographic interests or possibilities for the, for the different collections. For example, the museum in Paris holds very old, very old collections. So the, the geographic pattern here is surrounding the main roads and certain areas of, of the country. The American Museum of Natural History in New York holds very old collections that date back to the time that we were in war against the United States. And they sent several, of course, military, military uh, groups not to survey birds. It, it, they, they, want, they didn't want to collect birds, they wanted to collect Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> but for the, in this example, the American Museum has a long tradition of exploration in Mexico, several centuries, that, and it's reflected in the number of localities that are present. These are single localities of each, of each uh, for, for the collection. This is a pattern for the British Museum that is housed in Tring. The main, that mainly represents the work of the guys I mentioned before, Salvin and Gottman, the Biologia Centrale Americana. But you see that they did a very good work in surveying different areas. That is why this version of Oscar Wilde. Down. Yes, see, look at them. This version of Oscar Wilde is thinking that, oh, we did a good work. <laughs> we are able to track the work of individual collectors. For example, this, this is a professional collector that was hired by several museums during 20 years in Mexico. He was Wilmot Brown. He was collecting certain areas of, of the country, selling the specimens, beautiful specimens that are deposited in different museums along the United States and Europe. And you see that he had pre preferred areas for working. This is the, the specimen localities for Chester Lamb. This was a very famous collector. This is the most, most intensive collector of Mexican birds in the history. He alone collected 40,000 Mexican bird specimens and 30,000 Mexican mammals. He was hired by a rich person in California that held his own collection when the, that was Robert Timur. Once, once Moore died, he donated the collection to a, a small College that's more uh, that, uh, in California. 
But look, 30 years of work of Chester Lamb in Mexico, 70,000 specimens, and all these localities. <laughs> this is our collection, the Museo Zoología Facultad de Ciencias. This is the local. <laughs> this Good implies. Thing that Mexico now has Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's not Photoshop. It's the, it's the way you dress when nobody sees you. <laughs> more, a more recent collection, this is the collection where, where I work. This is a, a, more, a more recent survey. But we are able to track again <laughs> the, the history of collecting of, of one collector of Mexican birds, Billy Peterson. So at the end of, of this, we had, the, we had the opportunity to have most of the data of Mexican birds in collections. This is a temporal pattern of the deposition of specimens in different museums. And also you see uh, the, uh, the, important, the important trend that where the specimens have been deposited, it depends on where the researchers doing the, the field work we're working. So uh, the, the blue bar represents European museums. This is a, pr a proportion, the percentage of total specimens of, this, of, the, of, the, of the years. And you see, the first the Europeans were the, the ones that were developing the field work. Then we changed to the gringos. And then we changed to the Mexicans. So also this, this pattern is repeating the, the pattern we are, we are founding in the, in the bibliography. This also you have seen that, 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 that slide before. This is uh, uh, concentrated of the, depo the deposition, depositation of, of the collections. Most of the specimens are in, the, in museums in the USA, several in Europe. In, and in fact, I like one, one record here. We have one specimen record from the National Museum in, of Kenya. In Nairobi, they, they have one imperial woodpecker. So I need to add that to, to our database. What to, do, what to do next? We have to clean the database. Remember, we, we were obtaining data from very different sources. And essentially, what we've done is go into, into a computer, take the data directly from the specimens. Some, somebody was reading, somebody was capturing. And we, we had this, this messy database cap capturing different formats. The next step for us was to have a depurated database that implies to construct two types of, uh, of authority files. One is an authority file of taxonomy that will lead uh, cleaning the taxonomy problems. And one is a gazetteer, an authority, uh, an authority geographic file that will lead to the depuration of the geographic data and georeferencing. This, this is, we produce a database that was dirty, we process it to be clean, to have a clean database that we can use in several applications for doing some research. The way we georeference the data have changed also a long time. 